place, they all needed a place that was safe, that they could interact with humans, that they could love humans because they really did. And it, I didn't know where it was going to be in the United States. Maybe it could be in the Congo. And I really hoped that Matata could show them the way mm -hmm. in the Congo and that she could live long enough that we could get them mm -hmm. to a place like that. Do you remember the first time you encountered them? The bonobos? Yeah. Yes. Many of the first times that I encountered them, they hid. There was an indoor-outdoor room, and I would walk down to see them, and there was an empty cage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I would go around on the other side, and there was an empty cage. Mm -hmm. So I saw lots of empty cages, <laughs> but no bonobos, just little butts of bonobos mm -hmm. <laughs> in the door. And I experienced that for about two weeks. And finally I decided that I would have to do something about it. So I would just go a little bit down this long wing of 200 chimps, getting closer and closer to the bonobos and I could hear them, you know. But then <coughs> would sort of try to see them and as soon as they saw me, I would run hide. And after about two more weeks of running and hiding, every time they saw me I was able to get closer and closer and closer. And they were like, oh, we can scare her. All we have to do is stomp our feet or something like that, you know, and throw our hands up, and then she'll run away. So I let them do that for a while, and then I got closer and closer. And then I just opened the door and went in <laughs> and closed it behind me. There I was, right in the cage with them. And they just came and sat on my lap and gave me hugs and kisses and played with me, and I was really happy. And then I sneaked out before anybody knew I did it. And then I did it when the keepers were there, and the keepers didn't complain, so then I just started doing it every day. So no I was a scientist. Those were my studies. I was with apes, and I was studying these things, and then I set up these two other groups of apes that had the same sex age composition that were chimpanzees that were wild caught, so I was doing my three studies with all of these apes, but I didn't go in with the chimpanzees, but I went in with the bonobos every day every day. No one had gone in with uh, any chimps mm. up to that no. point? Not at Yerkes. Not that I ever. In, in a nursery sometimes, you know, with babies. But I mean, these were adults, uh, adolescent and adults. So then I did something even worse. I put a collar on them and I took them out of the cage. <laughs> And they started running as fast as they could run. They were going back to the Congo. And I was like going with them. And I knew, oh my God, I have to get these wild bonobos back into this cage. How, how am I going to do it if they don't come back into the cage? Well, when I started to get them back into the cage, they were going to bite me. They were not going back into the cage. They had been wild. And we didn't have the agreements that I had with Lucy or Poncho, and they didn't have any understanding of English, but they knew what being out of the cage was, and the only reason they put the collar on was because they knew I was pointing out of the cage, and they made that, oh, we can go out if we let Sue put this on. So Sue put this on, and Sue took them out, and they weren't coming back. So I had to dig in my heels and sit down like that and say, 
bite me. They're going back. I don't have any choice. And I got some little bites, and they went back in. And I began to take them out every day. I did do those things, and I learned things that nobody else could learn because I didn't do them. I didn't do them to be bad or to break rules. I, I did them to learn. I needed to learn. What kind of things did you learn from doing that that others couldn't learn? When you don't, ha it's like let's say you put human prisoners in a cage and they speak another language and you never talk to them. They become like animals. Mm -hmm. You dehumanize them. Apes are dehumanized by the conditions in which they are in. Mm -hmm. I had learned about chimpanzees by apes in every situation possible, the worst to the best. But I didn't know a thing about bonobos, and I needed to interact with them. I wasn't going to dehumanize them, de whatever they were. I needed to have them in more complex situations and interact with them. I mean, I could have taken data for years. Lots of people had. And guess what? Only now, only now, this was in 1970s. This is 2018. And now there is a publication in Science that says, oh, bonobos and chimpanzees have gestures. They have gestures. And they can communicate, but we think they're innate. <laughs> like, oh, just give me a break, okay? Give me a big break. Just read anything that was written after I had these experiences in the 70s. You don't need to do those studies to find that out. But maybe I didn't do it in the classical way, but I certainly went around telling people all of these things that had been found out, and I certainly published papers that uh, were appropriate enough, and they gave enough of this information that anybody that was interested in could begin to follow it up. But I, was, I wasn't interested in studying all of that and documenting it all again. I wanted to go further because if you've got that, what else have you got? You know, we had these three apes. We had Washo and Lana and Sarah. And oh, they were all learning language and they were all being published in science and all these other journals. And thousands of psychologists were going every time Duane or David Premack or Gardner spoke. And oh, apes and language, you know, and there are all these little training studies. And, and Washo was so different from Lana that I just was blown away. I had decided there was not anything worth that I could do with Washoe, and then I was like, Lana? I, I thought she was just like, had a different modality, you know? Oh no, it wasn't just a different modality. She was like a whole different thing I had, had no idea understood. It took me 30 years to understand what was really going on with Lana. And she was just, you know, I mean, the difference was, overwhelming again. No, and, and, and Lana was so different from Washoe. At first I felt the same way. I just don't know what to do. I thought I had the grasp on apes and ape language. And then I didn't know what to do when these, these bonobos were just doing... I mean, they had been raised in the wild. They knew what culture was. They knew what everything was. And they were in this little cage. The bonobos were different ages. There were two that were juvenile entering puberty, Matata and Osanjo. Uh, and of course they were different sexes. Osanjo was a male and Matata was a female. And uh, then there was a much older female, Lokalima, who looked to be about in her 80s. She had cataracts and arthritis and had lost a number of digits about halfway or a fourth of the way down and kind of had to walk on her hands like that, couldn't really walk on her knuckles anymore. And uh, her feet were very arthritic and her toes were all curled under and her legs couldn't really straighten out. She couldn't stand completely straight-legged. Uh, and it was clear that without the help of a tribe of bonobos, she wouldn't have been able to survive in the wild. And I had, I had not and have not seen any chimpanzee in the wild of that age. So it was amazing to find a bonobo that really had to have the help of the group for long periods of the day to be able to survive.
And one of the reasons that's important is because, well, we, we do have older humans, and uh, they help in terms of knowledge uh, that the younger ones might not have encountered for some time. So they kind of carry on knowledge across generations. And when things can change in the forest, an older bonobo can acknowledge that maybe none of the else in the group, uh, none of the other individuals have. And possibly the bonobos realize that and so therefore are able to take care of it, to take care of her. I think uh, Barbara Finley pointed out at the symposium the grandmother hypothesis. Uh, so I think maybe there are grandmother bonobos, at least uh, I felt that local Lima was a grandmother bonobo. What does that mean? The grandmother hypothesis. That the role of the grandmother has enabled humanity to achieve culture and achieve an expansion uh, that we haven't seen in the apes. Uh, so the, the, the grandmother is enabling the group to do things and survive that without the grandmother, the group wouldn't be able to do. The, the grandmother is also helping share, take care of the care of the baby and share the care of the baby with the human mother so it allows the human mother to go do things that you couldn't do if you didn't have a grandmother around. So it's about differences in maternal rearing and differences in knowledge that older individuals have in the group. Barbara didn't talk about the grandfather. The grandfather probably exerts a huge role in human society and in bonobo society. Hmm. <coughs> but not enough individuals have been studied to really know about that. But anyway, Lokalima was old, <laughs> and uh, Lokalima could not see very well. You could tell when she tried to pick up food, she would miss it. You know, there'd be a piece of food there, and she'd grab here, or she'd grab there, and she'd run over and try to grab the food, and she kind of had to grab all around before she could get it in her hands. So, and you could see her eyes were watery and dim a little bit, and she had very gray hair. Uh, so she was older than any ape I've ever seen at the, in, in the past and older than any ape I've, I've seen now. Uh, and in terms of moving to captivity, it was extremely hard on her. She seemed to have no ways of adapting to not being in the wild anymore. Losanjo and Matata w were attempting to adapt and they were attempting to make uh, communicative relationships with the chimpanzees in the next cage to touch and interact and play through the wire with the chimpanzees <coughs> and vocalize in ways that the chimpanzees could understand. They were trying to set up communication. with the, they, they were on the end, so there was only chimpanzees on one side, so they were trying to set up communication with chimpanzees. Locally, Ma wasn't interested in communication with chimpanzees. She wasn't interested in communication with me. When I went in, Matata and Bosanjo were immediately interested in communicating with me and climbing around on me and doing all kinds of things. But lo local Lima stayed back. And really, I could maybe slowly sort of touch her or slowly kind of interact with her with a little bit. I never took her out of the cage. She, she communicated frequently with Matata and Bosanjo, but she was not, I was something different to her, and she was not interested in communicating with me. Uh, later on, at one point, we had moved Lokalima, Matata, Bosanjo, and also some bonobos that came from San Diego into the language lab when I started the language work with the bonobos. And at that point, when I had local Lima in the language lab, one day I did attempt to kind of say, hey, you need to interact with me, and kind of pushed a little bit, not really very much, but pushed a little bit, because it had been two or three years and I hadn't gotten any interaction. And when I pushed a little bit, she immediately bit me. She hadn't bit me since I met her. She immediately bit me but she had only two teeth. <laughs> so she couldn't really hurt me very badly. I was bleeding a little bit, but the, the two teeth weren't even opposite each other, you know. So she, but she bit really hard. 
and she wouldn't let go. Well, I never had an eight bite and let, let go. I, that made no sense to me at all. It just hang on like you're a fish caught on a line. <laughs> this, I couldn't, I didn't know what to do. And she just kept biting me and biting me and biting me. So finally I called to one of the people, Sally Boyson, who worked with me. And I said, Sally, get her feet and pull on them. <laughs> so she could pull away. I can't get her to stop biting me. And Sally got her feet and pulled really hard and was pulling as hard as she could. And she was shaking Lokalima and pulling Lokalima. And Lokalima was still biting me. For like five minutes, Lokalima was biting me. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't get her to stop. So I thought, well, I guess I'll bite her. So I leaned down to try to bite her on her head where she was biting me. And as soon as she felt my teeth just barely touch her head, she let go and ran away. So I guess that maybe bonobos do that sometimes in the wild. I don't, I don't know. But uh, her personality was an enigma in a sense to me because I couldn't interact with her. Uh, of course she did interact with Bosanjo and Matata and she was very kind and caring. She insisted on sharing her food with them. She insisted on teaching them how to share their food with her. She insisted upon all proper bonobo copulatory activities before you share your food and teaching them this is how you do this in a copulatory bout and this is how you do that and taught them all kinds of proper gestures about how to assume your position, you know. So she was clearly in a relationship with them that was a teaching relationship. I wouldn't say it was sexual attraction, but she was teaching them proper bonobo social behaviors. And Matata learned them very well from local Lima, and she would try to teach them to the other bonobos. And from seeing all of this emphasis on, we call it sex, it's, it's not really sex, it's these are things that bonobos do in these situations, and we might call it sex, but it's like how you sit down, how you eat, how you treat other people, what you do before you eat, you know, all of these social behaviors that happen to involve genitalia if you're a bonobo, but it wasn't sex in the way we think of sex. And they, they all got very explicit instructions from local Lima, who passed them to Matata. Matata and Bosanja already knew quite a lot of them but she was still making sure they did them right. And then Matata passed them to the other bonobos. And the other bonobos always treated them as not sex, something you're supposed to do. So they have to learn that. And that they behavior. clearly had to learn it. And the bonobos that were later born and had all of this influence from humans were sort of like sometimes, why do we have to do this? <laughs> we don't really want to do this. <laughs> it seems so obligatory. <laughs> Uh, but in any case, uh, they had different roles as well as different personalities, and so it was, since there were only three of them, it was difficult to sort that out. M M Matata was the female, and Basanjo was the young male. They were both in puberty. And uh, Matata was very uh, shy and retiring and much quieter. Sanjo was very outgoing and display and brave and try anything new. Uh, and they were all watching everything that everybody did around them and trying, <coughs> except for local Lima, Matata and Bosanjo were watching everything that happened around them and trying to figure out what the people were doing and should they emulate it or should they not emulate it, where were they? And, of course, they lived in the wild where they had to learn everything and travel huge distances and, and understand the forest around them and all its complexities. So they, they had all these skills and they were trying to figure out how do you use these in this environment and what does it even need to learn in this environment. Loco Lima wasn't teaching them anything that related to that environment. So they knew I was a person and they knew I was friendly. So they were learning anything I could teach them. They were trying to learn and they were once they saw that I could be trusted they wanted to know if other people could be trusted they weren't so sure because other people didn't behave like I did but they they were always trying to pick up 
new knowledge from the environment that they were in and to adjust to it. And my perception of it was that they, they always tended to be non-aggressive at first. If they could be non-aggressive, if they could solve anything by even being submissive or whatever, that was always their first choice. Not because they were afraid, but be, the, the literature about bonobos not being aggressive seemed to be borne out by these captive bonobos. Whereas the chimpanzees adjacent to them had also been wild reared, didn't have much hesitancy about having fights. Bonobos didn't have really fights with each other and they didn't want fights with other people and they took pains to avoid that. I really got to know him when he was clinging to Matata and yeah. I walked into the uh -huh. cage and he jumped on me. Yeah. But before that he was six months at the field station with uh -huh. the other bonobos, some from San uh -huh. Diego and uh, some that Yerkes owned. Yeah. So I filmed him uh, several times a week in that situation uh -huh. and I saw how wonderful his father Bosanjo was. Uh -huh. And Bosanjo would go over and very carefully ask Matata this is a male. This doesn't happen in gorilla males. It doesn't uh -huh. happen in orang males. It doesn't happen in chimpanzee males. It happens in human males. Rosanja would go over and very carefully ask Matata if he could hold Kanzi. <laughs> and Matata would nod that he could, and he would very carefully take Kanzi and go all around the cage and play a little bit with Kanzi. And then Matata would kind of make a little sound, and he'd bring Kanzi right back. Nobody had yet reported that in the wild. That was startling. It had to be, quote unquote, natural bonobo behavior, but not instinctive bonobo behavior. That's a bad word now. <laughs> it's not instinctive, it's cultural. And bonobos were doing that. And, and the whole familial role has been said in humans. That's where we were different. We had males. The males helped carry the babies. The males helped the females. We were able to have more food. We were able to produce more babies. We were able to plan ahead in time and do things in a coordinated way because the males began to take on this role of helping care for the offspring. Uh, but human males don't often even do as much as bonobo males. There are males that do, but bonobo males are special. You were present at Kanzi's birth, no? Can you talk about that? Yes. Well, Kanzi was not Matata's natural baby. Mm -hmm. Matata's natural baby at that time was Akili, mm -hmm. fathered by Bosanjo. And Lorel, who had come from San Diego, became pregnant, and the father was also Bosanjo. Mm -hmm. And she had been reared in the nursery. She didn't have the benefit of a wild rearing like Matata. And she had never been pregnant before or helped take care of any baby before. Matata had probably helped take care of babies from the time she was a baby. Mm -hmm. So when Lorel had the baby, she was very exhausted and very tired and gave birth and within 20 to 30 minutes laid down on the floor and kept Kanzi with her but she didn't really seem to know quite exactly what to do. So Matata went over and while Laurel had her eyes closed, she took a little hand and then she took a, she put that on her and when it clinged, she took the other little hand and when it clinged and then she took the little foot and then she sort of moved away a little bit, she put this foot and then she was over there by the time, you know, Laurel woke up and Laurel looked at her and she's like, oh, Matata has Kanji, I'm sleepy. You know, so Matata kept Kanzi for five or 10 or 15 minutes, and then Laurel kind of woke up like, oh, where's Kanzi? <laughs> she went over and was trying to take Kanzi, and Matata was like, I'm just looking at him. He's really cute. And I have Akili and I have Kanzi. And Laurel kept following her around, and then she got tired again. And Matata pulled Kanzi up, and she looked at every little foot and every little finger, and she looked at his eyes. And by that time, the vets had been told that Matata had stolen the baby. So the vets came with their below dart guns mm -hmm. and they were going to dart Matata and Matata was having none of it. So every time 
you know, she'd watch and she could see when they were getting, put it up to their mouth, you know, so she would like, oh, here I am, here I'm a movie, here I'm a movie, there, and they put it up to their mouth and a back would come immediately or some portion of the baby that they would be afraid. So she seemed to know how to get them not to shoot the dark gun, although they really wanted to shoot the dark gun. And that went on for at least 45 minutes, and all the bonobos were screaming. Matata was screaming. And finally the vet gave up and was took a little break and tried to decide what to do, and thought, well, maybe I'll just leave Kanzi there, because he didn't want to make a mistake. And after that, when Laurel came and tried to take Kanzi, Matata wouldn't even think of it. Kanzi was her baby, and she nursed both of them, one on each side. When you saw the baby being born, did you did you feel like a relative? What does it feel like when you watch a baby being born like that? Well, when I when I mentioned yesterday that you know I just went into the bonobo cages. Yes. And I just took Bosanjo out. Yes. Uh, that wasn't really in my history with taking Lucy and Pancho in in sports cars. That was an abnormal thing for me to do. That was part uh -huh. of my job. I'd uh -huh. been taught as a graduate student, you know, that this is what you do. But the reason I had been taught that was because there was a study of language underway. And the gardeners who sent their student, Roger Fouts, to Oklahoma, the gardeners laid down the law that if we're going to study language, it's going to be as natural, from their viewpoint, as natural a situation as you could, which meant interacting mm -hmm. with the young ape. So Lemon allowed that because he was already rearing apes in human homes to see if they had maternal behavior mm -hmm. without, to see if they had chimp maternal behavior or human maternal mm -hmm. behavior. Mm -hmm. So what I was doing in the environment in which I grew up as a graduate student was not atypical. Mm -hmm. But it was atypical for Yerkes. Mm -hmm. uh, not for early Yerkes, not for Robert Yerkes himself. Robert Yerkes raised a bonobo and a chimpanzee in his own home. And he did all kinds of interaction studies and was the first to say apes could learn language if they had the right kind of exposure to language. Really? So there were some people that studied apes in white coats at Yerkes, and there were some people that interacted with them. There was this whole conglomeration of techniques in the 40s and early 30s in, in Orange Park, Florida. By the time Robert Yerkes died and Emory University took over, it became a biomedical facility. And in biomedical facilities, nobody wants to touch apes. You have diseases, you have body parts. You have, it, ape becomes non-being. It becomes just something, you know, to study as a biological replacement for a, a, a person. So all of those kinds of things that Yerkes had done had vanished at Yerkes. And nobody had ever done what I did because nobody ever thought of doing it. So I wasn't breaking any rules. Yerkes didn't have any rules against that. Mm -hmm. I was just doing something that nobody had ever done. So only after I did these things and people began to see what was coming of doing those things, they started to pass rules against them. <laughs> So I wasn't, I wasn't punished. People knew what I was doing. I didn't hide it, and I wasn't ever punished for it, mm -hmm. except the rules were changed, so those kinds of things could never happen again. So that has happened throughout my career. Everything that's been accomplished, rules have been changed to prevent this kind of thing from ever being done again because it's so startling. So I've been able to get where I have by taking some chances, but they haven't been chances that have been ill-considered or because I didn't really know what I was doing. So, so I, I did those kinds of things in Oklahoma, and I brought those kinds of tactics to Yerkes. And uh, because of that, and because I was studying language, and because it was interactive, I had the opportunity to do things such as get this eye contact going between Sherman and Austin and the nonverbal gestures going between Sherman and Austin in a way that's very human-oriented, that 
did not happen in Matsuzawa's lab until he sent NHK to study and videotape us and then began to make these things happen in his lab. Mm -hmm. And uh, Premack saw what we did, but he didn't want that to happen in his lab. And Tomasello tried to find a few chimps that were raised by as pets in human homes and tried to study them. But the only people that have really tried to replicate the work seriously are a few Japanese, Idani, tried to do it, and Aya Katz has tried to, to do it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, a, it's, as I said, it's a mixture of how a human would hold an ape standing upright and the kind of eye contact, and how a bonobo would hold an ape standing mm -hmm. up. And Kanzi had multiple mothers, in a sense, because both humans and bonobos share babies. Both humans and bonobos allow males to have a role in the baby care. Both humans and bonobos live in close-knit tribes. So it's very natural for this kind of thing to occur and very difficult for anybody else to replicate. Well, when you ask about how do you feel that he's born, how does your relationship yeah. with him develop, all of these things. As a scientist, you're not supposed to talk about these things. You, you're not, you, there has to be a divide between you and the subject. You're not, if you talk about your feelings, you're kind of dismissed. And people like Pinker say, if you have to be there to understand it, it's not science. Mm. So a lot of people have declared that what I've done is not science. But in order to do language, you, if you take a child and you don't have feeling, then although autism can be caused by lots of different things, that's true. If you take a child and raise that child as a scientist without any feeling, you will have an autistic child. I don't care if that child is perfectly normal. So if you don't allow feeling to be there, you're going to have a disturbed being. Mm -hmm. so if you let your feeling go where it wants to go, mm -hmm. then this becomes your child that's not quite normal. Mm -hmm. And you have to protect it from the world. You have to take special care of it. You have to worry about how you're going to give it the right kind of adult life. Mm -hmm. Where are you going to get money beyond next year? How do you keep a good relationship with the mother and all the apes together? How much do you really let it learn if it wants to learn human things? Do you stop it? Could it ever go back to the wild and still be with you? Can it ever really grow up? What are you going to do? I can't imagine loving a human child more than I love the bonobos. Mm -hmm. And I really love Shane mm -hmm. with all my heart and soul. But Shane knows that I love it all of those bonobos I raised as much as him, maybe more in certain situations because they can't do what he can do even if they have the intellectual capability. They're not going to be allowed. Mm. They're not going to be validated. They're always going to be discriminated against every moment of their life and I allowed them to be born in a situation which created that. And then they grew up to know that I created that. And then they grew up to know that somebody took me away. How, how can one cope with that? There's no coping. There's no intellectual way to make it right. I knew that I didn't want to separate Kanzi and Matata. And I had already tried when Matata was at Yerkes to teach her lexigrams and I had failed. But I decided to try again. So Liz and I spent every day for at least a 
a year and a half, two years, trying to teach Matata six lexigrams. Mm -hmm. Meantime, Matata would do things like, oh, let's go for a walk in the forest, you know, pull my hand toward the forest. And she'd take me out to the forest and look, and she'd go, ah, 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 ah. and I'm like, yes, I know you're talking about the forest, but I, I don't know what you're saying. And she's like, oh, what, what, what do we do? So we, we spent lots of time walking in the forest with Matata and Kanzi, and then coming back and working on six foods, and <laughs> Jason Tickle. And she did learn when I held up a food to hit a certain lexagram and she could ask for it. But she didn't have receptive skills, she didn't have naming skills, she didn't have statement skills, and she thought it was all stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't really blame her. And Kanzi, meantime, is just running here and there, climbing on the keyboard and jumping on everybody and seemingly not paying one bit of attention to the training. But he was really into the forest. You know, everything that his mother looked at or we stopped at. It's, it's, you know, just taking in tons of information. And I began to realize that Matata just seemed to know everything about the forest with not walking through it that much, and it was an African forest. And she seemed to know just which plants to eat and which plants not to eat, and I couldn't figure out how she did that. So I decided to put food at the base of certain trees and see how easy it was for her to remember those different trees. And uh, so I started out with like four different trees, and then I went to eight different trees, you know. and. Pretty soon we were like at 150 different trees and she had no problem and I couldn't keep track of so many trees. She knew she could remember any tree instantly and if there had been food there, she went to that tree and no other and looked for it again. So I, I knew that I was dealing with a kind of competency that in some ways was beyond mine and I didn't really know how to deal with it so I went back and worked on these six, six foods and ch chase and tickle. And, but also we, we had all kinds of social interaction with Kanzi because we were there all day long with Matata and Kanzi. So Kanzi played with us, Kanzi grinned with us, Kanzi tickled with us, Kanzi slept with us. Matata did all those things. We heard every noise in the lab. When there were firemen out there, we went to look at them. When there was a storm, we shared it together. We just shared every bit together. And Kanzi began to realize that uh, he could come and get certain things from us that, that he couldn't necessarily get from Matata. We had apples, we had oranges, we carried him on our shoulders, you know, and we have early pictures of where we're in the woods and Kanzi's being carried by us and then he gets down and he rides on Matata's back because he just went back and forth and he's telling us where to go by pointing mm -hmm. and then he gets on Matata's back and he's pointing. And Matata's walking like this, so she doesn't see him pointing. And he's like, Mom, why aren't you going where I'm pointing? And she's like, I'm going where I want, you know. <laughs> so we shared all those experiences, and we found lots of food in the woods. We found wild blackberries. We found clovers to eat. We found all kinds of little goodies and ferns and everything that Matata said was okay to eat. And they were always okay to eat. Huh. Even the mushrooms, she yeah. seemed to know what was okay to eat. And I never felt that Matata would not know what to eat. But I always worried that Kanzi would not know what to eat. So that's how we spent our time. And then the Yerkes primate facility said, it's time for Matata to breed again. And we're going to take her for six months to the field station, and she should have another baby. Well, that wasn't, I mean, it wasn't negotiable, that's who you were told. So I said, well, if you're going to do that, we need to wean Kanzi. Give us some time to wean Kanzi. And they said, well, we just have this drug that will dry her milk up. Her milk will be dried up in a few days, and then you take care of Kanzi, and she's going to the field station for probably six months and get pregnant. So I was like, oh, I don't really want to do this. But I gave Matata the drug, and in about two to three days, her milk started drying up. When her milk started drying up, Kanzi was furious. He would scream at her and try to hit her, and then he would scream at me and gesture to me and gesture to his mother like, you make her let me nurse. You make her give me milk. And I'm like, Kanzi, I can't. can't make her give you milk. You know? 
And that went on for a few days, and then they took her to the field station, and then suddenly I had to get Kanzi used to canned milk and doing things with me. And the thing we did for three days after Matata was taken to the field station was look everywhere until Kanzi could look no more in the forest for Matata. We looked here, we looked there, we looked and we looked. Had she hidden down here? Was she under this bush? Was she over there? We looked and looked and looked. That's all Kanzi wanted to do. He did eat, but you know, he looked for Matata. And then he looked every place in the lab that she could possibly hide after looking in the forest. We didn't find her. Finally he started to settle down. And as soon as he started to settle down, he just started using the keyboard. He knew all those six lexigrams. He knew just how to use them. You could give him a test. You could pass the test. He used 300 lexigrams the first day that he started to use them. And the previous, all that first couple of years, he had hardly used them ever. How did, you said you were just teaching his mom six. Yeah. So where did he get the 300? Well, we had six foods, and then we had, we had Chase and Tickle. I, I mean, he used them 300 times. Oh, oh. <laughs> Okay. Those six, <laughs> and then we started adding them, but but he knew all of them, and he hadn't been using them. Once or twice he kind of used them, and we never really knew if it was an accident or not. So that was a, a huge change in uh -huh. Kanzi. And then he began relating to humans as though they were as important as Matata had been. Uh -huh. But he had to. Uh -huh. And that wasn't intentional on our part, but we did take care of him round the clock. Nobody ever left him. He wasn't put in a little cage. He didn't go to sleep tonight by himself. Between three or four people that he knew very well, he was taken care of 24-7. And he loved all of those people very much. And he started to do some very interesting things. Uh, one morning a person named Janine Murphy, who was very close to him and later raised some of her children there in the lab, uh, this was before she had any children. She she came in and it was the morning shift and I guess I had left, I had slept all night with Kanzi and I left and Kanzi was still asleep. And I said, well, Kanzi's still asleep. So she went out to make a bottle and do some things in the kitchen to get ready for when he woke up. And I went on home and then she called me and she was screaming. She says, Kanzi's gone. Kanzi's gone, I can't find him anywhere. Kanzi's gone. And I said, well, how is he gone? And she said, I don't know. I left the bedroom door open and this other door, but I didn't see him go out. I can't believe he went out. I was in the kitchen. He's gone. So I raced down there. We looked everywhere. We looked outside. We looked inside. We looked in the colony room. We looked under things. We were calling his name. We got three or four people. We were looking, looking, looking. And by mid-morning, we were just scared to death. And we went in and we sat down on the bed, you know, where Kazi had slept with me. And we were like, what do we do? And there's this little lump under the blood. <laughs> and it kind of goes wiggle, wiggle. And it's like, it's like, well, here I am. <laughs> You've been there that whole time, hiding. <laughs> we didn't know he could hide that long, that quiet. He was tricking us. Oh, he, it was a game for him? It was a game for him. He'd done it on purpose. He hadn't been asleep or anything. He had been <laughs> hiding. And then we later, I mean, then later on, we realized, oh, he can do this. You know, and then we'd say, Kazi, we know you're hiding. You have to come out. You're scaring us to death. And would he come then? Yeah, he'd usually come. <laughs> then he'd start hiding in the forest. You know, we didn't have a lead. And he was like, I'm hiding. And we're like, well, you have to come out. And he'd go, mm, but we couldn't see him. <laughs> he'd make a noise so you could kind of find you knew, him. We knew he was there, but we didn't know where. <laughs> Did, uh, and then we were irresponsible, you see, because we're these people who are supposed to be responsible for apes, but we can't even find them, and we're letting them go out in the forest. How can you possibly do that? Well, he's hiding, you know. Kids hide. My son hid. He hid from me, you know, and, and people didn't take him away because he hid from me. How old was he when he did the hiding game first? Conzi? Yeah. Oh, he was probably three and a half. And you were, so you... Did. The, the lab had, was this a lab with a bedroom and a kitchen? It had uh, a bedroom, a very large kitchen, a living room, really three bedrooms, and a very large kitchen, and a living room, and a, a big uh, storage room. And you slept in a bed with Conzi? Yeah, in a double bed with Conzi. Every night? Every night. How did that feel? Did he hug you? Uh, yeah, sometimes he hugged me, sometimes he just laid beside me, just like I the way I took care of my brothers or sisters or Shane.
Did you read him stories like a child? Yes, and we showed him TV. We had TV stories at night, and we had book stories at night. Did he have favorite books? He had favorite books, and he had favorite movies. And then you, so what's a day like with Kanzi? Well, Matata eventually came back. Uh-huh. And sometimes he slept with Matata, and sometimes he slept with a person. And it was pretty much up to him. And when I went to see Bonobos in the Wild, when I would get there really early, before they would wake up, you'd see these nests really, really high, you know, 200 feet up in the air. And sometimes early in the morning, just as it would start to get light, you'd see these little bitty bonobos, just this big. (laughs) They'd be climbing across the branches all along the way from this one nest, and then they'd go to this other nest, and everybody would go, oh, we're so happy you're back, you know? And I felt like, although I didn't have enough, they were too high and I didn't know the individuals, but it seemed like they were sleeping over, you know, and they were going home. (laughs) Uh-huh. And and so I didn't think it so unusual then that sometimes Kanzi slept with me or Liz or sometimes with Matata and it just seemed normal. So we did that and uh, as he grew older, we began to put food every day in eventually 18 places in the forest because I wanted to try, I wanted to study language, but not in a human world. I wanted it to be as much like a bonobo world as possible, and what the bonobos do, they travel through the forest and they eat food. So every morning around four o'clock, Bill Hopkins would take a four-wheel drive, four tracks, and pack food in a very nice cooler with ice, and take it to these many locations throughout this 50-acre forest. And I had carved out little trails through all the forest. Part of it was swamp, and we had had a wooden bridge built so you could walk across a wooden bridge where it was swampy. And there were hills, and there were fields, and there were blackberry bushes and thorny bushes, and there were walnut trees, and there were a few fruit trees, natural, and there were deer, There were panthers, there were raccoons, there were wild dogs, and there were other things we left very amazing footprints that we couldn't even identify. This is in Yerkes, in Georgia, so there were panthers. This is in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Yes, we saw panthers frequently. Mm -hmm. We lived in a place that was owned by Georgia State, and it was called Panthersville. And so... What time would you get up in the morning, and what was your day like? Oh, con- whenever Kanzi woke up, between 6 and 8 o'clock. And, you know, you kind of play around the lab and tickle and groom. Maybe you would change staff, if depending on who slept and somebody else came in. And then Bill Hopkins would take the food out into the woods. And then when Kanzi got ready, he'd go out in the woods, and we'd carry our keyboards. And we'd talk about where he wanted to go. And at first he didn't know, you know, the names of the places, but he liked going and we would carry him. And sometimes Matata would go with us and sometimes she would stay in the lab. And we would show him pictures, like you want to go to A-frame and get bananas. And we'd put him on our shoulders and he'd pick, well, I want apples or milk or bananas. He could look at the picture and pick that one up. And then we'd give it to him and he'd hold it the whole way. He'd hold it there and we'd say, oh, you want apples, we're going to go get apples, you know, and when we would get apples, we'd ask him if he wanted to chase or tickle or play in the trees, and we would, had kind of something we did that was different at each location, Mm -hmm. and along about evening time, we'd come back and watch TV and go to bed. How would he, how would he tell you what he wanted to watch? Well, each TV could have a picture on it, you know, you have a picture of Harry and the Hendersons or Quest for Fire and he could point to that picture and he could put it he could put it in the thing and push a button and turn it on. By the time he was four I'd say. So he would point and he did it was it set up in a way that he could go get it? So he could point get the thing and put it in? Yeah, you could show him two or three tapes or there'd be sometimes a stack of ten or twelve would rise by the television, you know, and he could look through them and 
Sure, you wanted that one. You'd watch with him always? Or? Always, yeah. Uh huh. And then sometimes you read him bedtime stories? Yes, we read him stories. He preferred movies at night, so most of the time, but we did read stories. I mean, uh, I mean, I'm sure you heard Hansel and Gretel and Goldilocks and the Three Bears and the, the Wicked Witch of the West and, <laughs> and uh, you know, typical children's stories. So did he like Harry children? Potter? He liked, and Yoda really liked Harry Potter. And they would choose, he would choose, did you have to do them over and over again the way children? Uh, Mostly the movies were asked for over and over, not so much the, the stories. And were the movies, did they tend to there be? There were some like stories that later on people told me that Pam and Isha asked for more and more. She asked, tend to ask for stories more. But we also made videotapes during the day and they could watch tapes of what they did during the day, or they could watch tapes of what had happened on other days, and they also liked those very much. So they, you would show them themselves? Then. Sometimes, yeah. And how did they respond to those tapes? Watching they them? loved those tapes. They got to see what they did, and it's kind of like talking about what we did during the day, and they would make all different kinds of vocalizations. I mean, now I realize they were talking with the vocalizations, but then I didn't know, I just knew they made all kinds of different sounds about them, and they were very interested in them. And I assume they recognized themselves, or no? I can tell you of a study that I did, which is probably on NHK footage, mm -hmm. in which I took photographs of them, photographs of humans, photographs of ducks and turtles and all different kinds of animals, and uh, I put them in different categories in a big tray. So the humans went here, the animals went there, Sherman and Austin went here, and the people that worked with them that were family went there. And then I gave them additional photographs like that, and they sorted each one in the right pile. And then I gave them photographs of themselves, and they put them in the family human pile without a batting an eye. And one of the most powerful television shows that affected them was Harry and the Hendersons. Each one had a video that became kind of their life, their person, their future. They are going to be like that. They pick it out from the movies. All they watch hundreds and hundreds of movies. Well, Pam and Isha had to watch Harry and the Hendersons over and over and over and over and over. Do you know Harry and the Hendersons? I don't know. Well, there's this family, and they're driving along in the woods in a station wagon. And what did we do every day when it was too cold to walk with our backpacks? We got in our cars, and we drove through the woods, 50, 100 acres of woods, and we went to the feeding sites. So she understood about all these kids, some bonobos, some humans. You know, they're riding in this station wagon, and they go through this forest, and they hit something. Something rushes across the road, and they hit it. Boom, in the car. And we'd hit things in the car. Big bumps, things that came up, you know. And so they hit this thing and they get out and it's a Bigfoot. And it's lying there and apparently it's dead. So they work really hard to tie it to the top of their station wagon. <laughs> like this. And they drive home and it gets dark and they drive in the garage. And they're getting in the garage and they're like, what are we going to do? We have this dead, Bigfoot dead. And in their house, they have all of these trophies, you know, this deer and this buffalo, and, you know, the father is a hunter. And he has this whole room with trophies. And you kind of notice that when you go in, and you're like, are they going to make a trophy of Bigfoot? <laughs> so they're trying to decide what to do, and, and, and in the morning, I'm not sure the, exactly, but some, at some point, Bigfoot wakes up. He's not dead. And he starts trying to get off the car, and he kind of bops his ropes, and then he kind of looks in, and, he, and there's the whole family go, <laughs> and Bigfoot just like walks in their house, and they think he's going to kill them. And there's this little girl, this human little girl, just Pam and Isha's age, and she identified immediately. She was that girl. And this girl, kind of like in the modern Planet of the Apes movie that's just made now, this little girl identifies with Bigfoot. And she goes over and gives him some piece of food or something. And she's very nice. And she's the only one that's not afraid of him. And Bigfoot doesn't hurt 
this little girl. So he kind of stays around and the family goes to work and they don't know what to do with him because so they just let him stay in the house and they feed him and he starts watching TV and he watches TV and watches TV and watches TV and they realize he's kind of okay. He smells, you know, and he's kind of awkward, but he's like sits around and eats and watches TV and then he learns English. Hmm. And then he starts to get a sense of who he is and who they are and they get a sense of who they are who he is mm -hmm. and then they all get very protective of him and they're trying to hide him from the neighbors and they're trying to figure out what are we going to do we, he, he's, he's like a person but he's an ape and what are we going to do with him and, and Pamanisha knew she knew that Kanzi was like that to us she was like that to us it, I mean when she, she watched it over and over and over and over and over and she always asked for it at first she didn't know then she got it, and she got it especially when Heather, Liz's daughter, who had been raised around Pamanisha all the time, Heather went to school, and Pamanisha wasn't allowed to go to school, and they had to be apart. And she took me in, and she asked me to watch that movie with her, and she cried, and tears came out of her eyes. And there's one scene in there where the the Bigfoot goes into the trophy room and he takes these animals off of the wall and he digs in the garden and he buries the animals. Mm -hmm. And Pamanisha just pointed to that scene over and over and cried and looked at me. And I understood that she was realizing that in our, not me per se, but in our human concept, she's an animal. And she doesn't know what to do about the fact that she's been around all these people who loved her. Her life's been great. She's growing up. She's thinking she's going to go on to school and do all these things. She understands tons of language. And then she's realizing that's not... Sue isn't even allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. Did you say she uh, cried at the scene where the animal heads were being buried? She cried before that, and she uh, cried through that scene, and she, she was very adamant that I, that before she'd just always seen that scene, I mm -hmm. needed to sit down and watch and understand that scene with her. Someone, I mean, someone's being buried in that scene. Someone is being buried. The being that's being buried is not dead. And the being that's burying them is thought of as an animal, but that being is being more caring about animals that are dead than humans that are alive are. The humans, they put them up on the wall. Mm -hmm. He didn't want them on the wall. And he wasn't an animal. He had that, he had that caring in his heart that we didn't have. And Pamanisha understood it she realized that other human beings thought of her as an animal she could be ahead up there because she looked more like Harry but she had identified all along as the little girl in the movie oh. how did she know Did who told her or how was she told that Heather was going to school Liz had to tell her because she came and worked every day with Heather and Pamanisha, and she had to tell her, Heather can't come anymore now and stay here. First of all, people began to object that Heather and Pamanisha were together, and it was also time for Heather to go to school. And Pamanisha understood that we were, that Liz and I wanted this to happen, but we couldn't. We were in a society where we couldn't do. And so she began to realize some of this society I'm seeing in the movie, all these these people in this movie are having trouble knowing what to do with Harry because, Henderson, Harry, because the people outside the house are causing a problem. And then she began to realize we're in that situation. And what did you do when she cried? I cried. I didn't know what to do. I was told bonobos didn't cry. They didn't have tears. Oh, really? They do. Did you talk to her? I, I didn't know what to say to her. 
I didn't know what to say to me.